Hi everyone, welcome. We are live on uh, Facebook, Twitter and YouTube. Uh, this is our session on DMX and RDM. If you've got any questions, feel free to uh, just type them in the comments of any of those platforms and they will come through to me. I will do my best to answer them all, uh, but if I don't get around to yours, don't panic. After the session, last about an hour, uh, I'll go through and answer any questions that I don't uh, manage to get through. Um, so yeah, this is our session on DMX and RDM. It lasts about an hour. As I say, feel free to ask any questions. My name's John, I'm Product Manager for Zero ATA. Um, and so we're going to start off with uh, answering the question, why are we here? I always think it's a very useful question to ask. And so if we were face to face, I would be showing you this. It's the world's simplest lighting setup. So we have a console, we have a moving light, and we have a piece of cable in between. And we probably spend a lot of time thinking about our consoles and doing training sessions over them. And we've got various training sessions this week and next week that are all being streamed about 08 consoles and general console terms. Have a look at 08.com forward slash training for those. We spend a lot of time looking at videos and shootouts of moving lights and LEDs and so on. But maybe we don't spend so much time looking at this bit of cable in the middle. And so that is what we're going to do for the next uh, hour or so. And down this cable, I would argue there are three things we want to be able to do. We want to be able to configure our lights. We want to be able to obviously control our lights. And we want to be able to monitor our lights. We want to know what's going on. And if we can do all of these three things, then we're in a really good position. And so we're going to look at how we can do all of these three things using DMX and RDM today. And next week, there is a kind of follow-on session about Ethernet protocols. So ArtNet, Streaming ACN, RDMNet, and so on. Um, and so we will look at how to do these three things over Ethernet. Um, and so because you can do some of these things over DMX, you can do some of these things over RDM, I will show you this little table that says tick or cross of whether DMX or RDM can do these throughout the session. So hopefully that's helpful to you. And so our agenda for the, the next um, hour is we're going to look at eight bits of key terminology. It will take about two minutes to do that. Um, just things that I think are really helpful to know before we start. And then we'll look at DMX and then we'll look at RDM. So that is the plan. So first of all, terminology. Um, protocol. Protocol is a set of rules about how one thing um, can talk to another thing. So for example, if you were to go and see the Queen, there is a protocol. There is a way you have to act. There's a way you have to behave. There's a way you have to address the Queen. That is a protocol. And we do exactly the same in lighting. There are protocols. There are sets of rules about how a lighting console can talk to a light and so on. And if they both follow those rules, they should be able to talk absolutely fine. Now, there are standard protocols. This is where uh, lots of different people have all agreed a particular way and a particular level of quality to do something. So in the entertainment industry, there are lots of standard um, lighting protocols. DMX and RDM are both standards where many, many manufacturers and end users from all over the industry and all over the world have come together and said, yes, this is how we want things to work. And if you follow these rules and if you use equipment that follows these standards, it means you're not locked in. So you can have anybody's lighting console and anybody's lighting fixture and they should be able to communicate really happily. The opposite of that is proprietary, where a particular company has said, this is the way we think it should work. Um, and it means that no one else has had a look in on that. And it often means for you as end users, you get locked in to having to use the same company's console and fixtures or other boxes in your network. So we're not fans of proprietary protocols at 088. We much prefer the standard ones and we push hard to use standard protocols. Um, the next two words, analog and digital, both DMX and RDM are digital signals, but an analog signal may be what you're used to in say a, a sound system, those sorts of things. If you were to cut the cable uh, and were able to kind of listen somehow down a cable, you would see or hear a continuously variable signal going down that cable. But like I say, we're looking at two digital signals today. Uh, often you hear those as ones and zeros or noughts, um, so yeah, noughts and ones or highs and lows or ons and offs. Um, a digital signal is much cleaner and when it gets to the end of your, your lighting chain, it's much easier to, to see what's going on for the device. So we're using nice clean digital signals. 
Um, and then the last two, unidirectional. This has been unidirectional so far. There's no questions that I can see, so it's just me talking to you guys. It's one-way communication, but hopefully you will ask some questions shortly, and then this will turn into bidirectional, and you will ask questions, and I will answer them, and there'll be two-way communication going on. Exactly the same as in lighting. Uh, DMX is a unidirectional, so it's one way only, um, and RDM is bidirectional, it's two ways, and we will look at what that means for you guys as end users very shortly. So there we go, boring bit done, that's the terminology, now we're going to uh, start looking into what you're really here for, which is DMX and RDM, so I hope this is helpful to you. So DMX um, stands for Digital Multiplex, um, or actually, in reality, it doesn't, it stands for this, ANSI E111 2008, revised in 2018, blah, 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 blah. But for now, we're just gonna call it digital multiplex, but that is the, the official full name of the DMX standard there. And DMX supports 512 channels down a single cable. And when it was developed back in the, the 1980s, um, that meant 512 parkans or profiles or finales or whatever it might be. And that was way more than uh, you could really imagine in a lighting system. But nowadays we're using DMX um, for lots of things that it was never intended for. So we're using it for moving lights and for LEDs and even in some situations, little media servers and things. Um, and so we're using many, many more channels to control just one fixture. And so 512 is no longer that many. Um, and so we often find ourselves needing more than 512, and we call that an, another universe. So you run a second cable, and that is your second universe, or a third cable, or a fourth. And you can easily get into the hundreds of universes on some larger setups nowadays. So 512 channels per single cable coming out the back of your lighting console. On that cable, the official rule is 32 devices. Um, this is not set in stone nowadays. Um, equipment's much better quality, and you can generally go above 32 without too much of an issue, but officially it's 32. Um, unlike the 512 channels, which is very much set in stone, you cannot get 513 channels down a cable. You probably could happily have 33, 34, or significantly more devices on a cable. But if you want to be doing everything to the book perfectly, you want to be down in the, the 30s maximum on a cable. And in a minute, we'll look at how DMX works, but it daisy chains through devices. So each device is one of those. Uh, so here we go. This is what we call the topology of a DMX network. Topology is just a posh word for how you wire it up. Um, and as you can see, we come out of the lighting console and we go through whatever devices we have in the network. And in this situation, those beta packs there, they take up six channels each. So that's 18 channels on the top row, and then the moving lights, they could easily be 20, 30, 40 channels each, if not more. And so you can see how we know we're near our 32 devices in this setup, but we could quite, hap quite easily be uh, close to our 512 channel limitation. Now at the end there, we have a terminator. I'm sure no one that's listening in would ever dream of not using a DMX terminator on their network. Officially, you do have to have one. Um, it, it's kind of hard to explain exactly what that's doing, but my uh, example is it, it's, um, it stops what are called reflections. So if I was to um, run into a brick wall, I know that sounds silly, but if I was to run into a brick wall, I would bounce back from that wall. Whereas if I got a mattress and gaffer taped it to the wall and then I ran into it, it would soften the blow and it would stop me bouncing back so much. And in very basic terms, the DMX Terminator is kind of doing that. It's stopping any reflections um, down the line and um, those reflections can cause those last couple moving lights to get pretty confused. Now realistically lots of us will be running DMX setups that don't use terminators and it's probably working fine. When you get into the world of remote device management the DMX terminator becomes a bit more crucial but it is also dependent on the quality of the equipment, the cabling, how many devices, how long the cable is, lots and lots of things. But officially, we should be using DMX terminators, and I strongly encourage you to do that. Now, this is another way we can be running a DMX network using something called a DMX splitter. Uh, in this situation, we now have three lines of DMX coming out of our splitter. Still got that total limitation of 512 channels. That hasn't changed. But the advantage here is probably a reduction in cabling, if you imagine these being three separate lighting bars. 
Um, I'm not having to loop through from the end of one bar back to the beginning of the other. There's also an element of redundancy here, um, or reliability I should say. So if you lose any one of these cables in your system, you're not going to lose your whole lighting network, you're only going to lose part of your lighting network. So you, you have some security there by using a DMX splitter. Um, but there are now three end of lines, so you do need to have three DMX terminators in this situation. It's worth us thinking about these splitters. This is our 0 to 8 splitter 8, but there's many, many splitters out there on the market. Um, and this is an 8-port splitter, but if you're anything like me, uh, there's a good chance you've used this in the past, not as an 8-port splitter, but as a 9-port splitter, because it's got 8 outputs, it also has a 3. And on the whole, that's probably fine, but there are some key differences between the through and the outputs that are worth being aware of. So the input and the through, there's nothing electrically clever happening there, they're just physically connected together. The advantage of that means that if this device is not turned on, if you just unplug it or if anything goes wrong with the device electrically, the input and the through will continue to work, even if the device is unplugged or there's no power or there's an electrical fault with it, they'll continue to work. So if you're daisy chaining through to additional splitters, you have reliability there because you're not dependent on the first device to ensure the second device works. Um, whereas 1 to 8, um, they are um, being regenerated, the DMX signal, um, sometimes that's called rebuffered, um, and that means that the signal should be a lot stronger coming out of them, but if that device goes wrong or if the device is turned off, the DMX will not come out of 1 to 8. So that's the downside, but there is an advantage as well, which is your 32 device limitation restarts on each one of those. So you could have 20, 30 devices before this splitter, and then as long as you come out of the 1 to 8, you could have another 20 or 30 devices after it, absolutely perfectly safely. Whereas if you use the through, your device count continues, it does not restart. So just worth bearing in mind those positives and negatives of using the through versus the outputs of a DMX splitter. Now DMX uses 5-pin XLR connectors. Um, which probably begs the question, is 3-pin XLR allowed? I'm sure you've seen lots of devices that have 3-pin. Well, rather than that, answering that myself, I'm going to let the DMX standard answer it. So I've got a few screenshots here directly from the DMX standard, and you can uh, make your own choice up on whether 3-pin is allowed. So first of all, the standard says equipment shall use 5-pin XLR. It says... A concession to use an alternative connector is only available when it is physically impossible to mount a 5-pin XLR connector on the product. Now, a 5-pin XLR connector is exactly the same size as a 3-pin XLR connector. So if it's physically impossible to mount a 5-pin, it's also physically impossible to mount a 3-pin. And then lastly, just to make sure we're definite about this, uh, the standard says an alternative connector shall not be any type of XLR. So uh, the answer to is 3-pin allowed is quite clearly a no, it is not allowed. So then the next question is, well, why does it work then? Why can't I use 3-pin? Well, this is how a DMX cable is wired. You'll see that there's pin 1 there, which is a common, and then pins 2 and 3 are data plus and minus. Electric, electrics are always circuits, remember, so we've got a plus and a minus. And then pins 4 and 5 are data 2, and you'll see there it says they are optional, and we don't use them. And so we actually only use pins 1, 2, and 3, and it's for that reason that 3-pin um, XLR works fine. When this standard was developed earlier, I said it was back in the 80s, there were various um, possibilities of what pins two and uh, sorry, pins 4 and 5 would do. Potentially it could be used to get data back from the fixtures, potentially it could be used for a second universe of DMX, all sorts of ideas, um, but none of them are official, and if you try and use pins 4 and 5 for anything, there's no guarantee that they're going to work. In fact, most DMX cables, even if they are 5-pin, often only have three cores that are actually soldered all the way through. So um, we do only use pins 1, 2, and 3, and there's lots of misconceptions out there that uh, remote device management uses pins 4 and 5. That's completely not true. We'll cover that um, a bit later on in the session. So that is why 3-pin XLR um, physically works, but you shouldn't be using it. 
Uh, max cable length of DMX is theoretically um, over a kilometer, but you never want to be running anything anywhere near maximum really. So we would recommend, and uh, we've spoken to various people and they all seem to agree, uh, 300 meters to 450 meters recommendation. So that's the sort of length you want to be running your cables. Um, and that includes the daisy chaining between fixtures. But if you're using a DMX splitter, as long as you come out through an out and not the through, uh, that cable length restarts in the same way that the, the number of devices restarts. Uh, DMX is not appropriate for um, hazardous applications. Um, and again, I'll just show you this on the standard so you know I'm not making it up. Um, this is uh, straight from the standard, so it says um, it is appropriate for non-hazardous and it is not appropriate for hazardous applications. So please do not use DMX for things like pyrotechnics or anything that can move and trap someone. Um, if you've ever run a DMX cable and a power cable next to each other um, and then turned on and off the power cable, um, sometimes, depending on the quality of cabling and all those sorts of things, um, you can see a flicker on DMX. Now, if that's just a, a flicker of a light on stage, that's not the end of the world. But if that's a flicker of a pyrotechnic, that could easily be the end of someone's world. So please do not use DMX for hazardous applications. Okay, and it is unidirectional communication only. So we said this earlier so far. Uh, I don't think we've had any questions that I've seen. Um, so DMX is one way in the same way that this uh, session so far has been one way communication. DMX has no idea what is on the other end of the cable. In fact, it doesn't even know if there is a cable plugged in. It's, I call it fire and forget. It's just spitting out data from your lighting console, spitting it out. Um, and hoping that the message gets to the other end. But it doesn't know that the message gets to the end, it doesn't know that there's a cable plugged in, it's just hoping it does. So fire and forget, it's unidirectional only. Okay. So DMX, unidirectional only, uh, 512 channels, 32 devices, not suitable for hazardous applications, and so on. Um, it only allows us to control our fixtures. It doesn't allow us to configure them. It doesn't allow us to monitor them. So configuration might be changing its settings or something like that. Monitoring might be you know, seeing how hot it is or what the lamp life of it is or if there's any errors. We can't do any of those things over DMX. We can only control our fixtures. And that's the end of our main section on DMX. Like I say, feel free to ask questions on uh, Facebook, YouTube, or um, Twitter slash Periscope if you'd like to. Uh, we're going to move over to remote device management now. Um, but you know, DMX and RDM very much live together. And so um, as we're talking through remote device management, there will be sections where we uh, go back and review DMX a bit. So that's the plan. Remote device management stands for, oh sorry, RDM stands for Remote Device Management. Uh, just like with DMX, there is a, a larger title here, and C E120, 2010, etc, etc, etc. Um, and I'm just going to show you a quick video to introduce you to RDM. This will give you a bit of an idea before I then go in more, more in depth. So uh, this is my colleague Keith, um, and a couple of years ago we made a video just showing the sorts of things you can do with remote device management. If I was doing this presentation face to face we would have a setup, but um, as I can show that to you in real life, here's a little video. RDM can be used to remotely configure your fixtures by changing the address or mode. For instance, if I select the six here, which relate to the beta pack, if I go into setup, click on address, I can change the address to say 100. The pack automatically updates for me. The same with mode. So the light is currently on mode 10. If I select the light from the desk, select change profile, you'll automatically see it updates on there. The revert rig option allows you to undo the changes that we've just made. To do this, if you go into inputs and outputs and click on the revert rig, it will change the dimmer pack back to address 1 and put this back to mode 10. We think you'll find this useful in touring by being able to put the house rig back to how you found it when you first turned up at the venue. We can also see this being useful in rental companies when you want to prep returned kit back to your default settings by simply pressing one button and resending the information to the devices. 
It's also possible to disable the RDM per output. So this deck has two outputs, output one and output two. I can go in and disable output two, so it's sending the same information out, but without the RDM content. Okay, so that is an example of how remote device management allows you from your console to change settings on your lighting fixtures. So remote device management is bi-directional communication. It is two-way communication. The console speaks to the lights or the fixtures or whatever devices are out there, and those devices can respond to the questions asked by the console. Um, it works over normal DMX cabling, and it still only uses pins one, two, and three, like I said earlier. Um, so some people think DMX is one way and RDM is the other way. That's not strictly true. DMX is one way and RDM is in both directions. Um, and so if we were um, able to chop open a DMX cable and listen to it, it would look a bit like this. It's what we call a streaming protocol, and which means it's just continuously outputting data. So when your um, lights are at 50% intensity and they are not changing, there is still DMX data getting sent to them. And the DMX data is just saying, channel one do this, channel two do this, channel three do this, and it's just repeating all the way to 512. And when it gets to 512, it starts again, channel one do this, channel two do this, channel three do this. And it does that process all the way through 512 and starting again. It does that between 30 and 40-ish times a second, depending on the console and your setup, but roughly 30 to 40 times a second. It is continuously going through doing that. And if you're interested, this is still uh, vastly simplified, but this is the kind of thing it looks like uh, if you were to, to put a meter on it and actually look at the signal. And you'll notice that there are um, this nice gap here in the DMX signal. And so it is here that we put what we call the RDM question and the RDM answer. There's always a question first. So if a, uh, a fixture is on fire, it cannot tell your lighting console that it is on fire unless your lighting console asks it, are you on fire? Um, or if it asks it something else, the fixture can reply and say, yeah, that's fine, but I have this bigger issue, which is I'm on fire. But it always has to be initiated from the console. Um, and so because we put it in this gap here, and um, that's how we've managed to make DMX and RDM both work at the same time over pins one, two, and three. And so, as I said earlier, it's a streaming um, protocol. This happens roughly 30 to 40 times. So uh, simplifying things quite a lot, you can roughly get 30 to 40 RDM questions and answers in a second. So if you wanted to set the DMX address of 30 or 40 different fixtures, that would take well, you know, between one to two seconds, very, very roughly making a lot of assumptions. But that gives you a sort of time frame you can do this in, which um, is significantly quicker than using a ladder, um, but significantly slower than the data you would be used to when you stream Netflix or something like that. So it's uh, in data terms, it's not a fast protocol, but in uh, the reality of what this replaces, which is getting the ladder out and climbing up it, it's much, much quicker. Uh, so RDM provides monitoring and it provides configuration. It does not provide control. So we still use DMX to control our fixtures, to, to, to tell them be at 50%, point over there, be in red. That is still done via DMX. But RDM can then say, right, change your DMX address or what temperature is your lamp at, all of those sorts of things. So let's just have a quick look at the sort of things we can do over RDM that is that monitoring and that configuration. Um, so the most, most basic one that most people are aware of is we can change the DMX address of our fixtures. So RDM uh, communicates to the fixtures not using their DMX address. And because of that, it means it can change the DMX address. So I could have 30 moving lights that are all set to DMX address 1. And I could still speak to them individually, which I can't do using DMX, but I can do using RDM. I can change the mode. So lots of fixtures have different modes of operation. Um, and you select which mode you want, well, using RDM, we can do that remotely. We can build fixture personalities using RDM. So your lighting console will have a library of fixture personalities, and that is how the lighting console knows how to control the light. And you have to go in and through a process called patching, uh, you have to say to your lighting console, okay, well, I have 
20 of this type of moving light in this mode and so on and then you build it up and you select the personality from the console and that's how the console knows how to control the lights. Uh, if your library in your console doesn't have your moving light, maybe your moving light was made after your console was made and you've not updated the library in your console, um, you're going to have a massive problem trying to control that light from your console and you either have to get in touch with the manufacturer to get a software update or you know all sorts of pain whereas using remote device management the lighting console and the moving light can talk and discuss and create their own fixture personality it's quite basic it's not going to include all the maybe advanced features of gobo images and all of those sorts of things but at least it's going to get you to a point where you can control your um your fixtures uh, you can name and identify your fixtures. So when you've got 30 different uh, lights up in the rig, you can find out um, you know, which one's which. You can give them names. You can say, okay, well, which one am I actually talking to? And it will identify itself. The way it identifies is up to the fixture, but it might start flashing or um, spinning or something like that. So let's name and identify. Uh, we can do fault finding, so you can um, remotely from your lighting console find out what problems you might have in your rig. Is there a stuck colour wheel? Is it overheating? All of those sorts of things. You can do a rig check, so you can find out do you have everything? Is there a whole lighting bar missing or has something been unplugged that should have been there? So you can check to make sure you've got your whole rig working. We can invert the pan and tilt. Lots of lighting consoles will have this feature built into them already, but lots of moving lights have the feature built into the moving light already as well, and you can pick which one you use. But using RDM from the console, you can change the setting on the fixture. You can monitor all the settings. So like I say, that might be temperature or lamp life. They're, they're the kind of obvious ones. And then maybe not so interesting to end users, but to manufacturers, we can run factory tests and all of those sorts of things using remote device management. Uh, we've got a question here from YouTube. Do fixtures have a unique RDM address or does this have to be set up up front? Brilliant question. Thank you for that. So um, yeah, remote device management, any device that has RDM built into it will have a unique ID. Um, you don't need to know that as an end user. It's just how the devices talk. Um, you can't change that. Um, normally, you can find out what it is through a menu system somewhere, but you kind of don't need to worry about it too much. Um, but it will be unique. So if you're familiar with MAC addresses on your computer, it's kind of the RDM equivalent of that. So yes, every device that you buy will have its own unique uh, R, um, RDM ID. Hopefully that answers your question. If it doesn't, just reply and we will go into it a bit more in depth. Uh, so RDM clearly helps combat working at height and access issues. You put your whole lighting rig up into the air and then you build your set underneath it and then you realize you for set the DMX address slightly wrong, or there's one of the fixtures has the wrong mode, or the pan tilt setting is incorrect and it's still uh, set from a previous rental or something like that. Um, that's a, a massive pain if you're just using DMX, where with RDM you can do that all remotely. So massive benefits. It's message-based communication. I kind of uh, led on to this earlier. Um, so it, you can almost look at it like a WhatsApp conversation. The console asks the question, the fixture replies. The console asks another question, the fixture replies. Um, and these are the sorts of communications that can happen down the line. So your console can say, are you there? Yes, I'm here. What are you? Well, I'm a dimmer. Okay, well, who made you? I was made by 0 H8. Okay, well, what shall I call you? I'm called a beta pack. Okay, well, what software are you running? I'm running software version 2. How many channels do you have? I have six channels. Okay, well, what can you do? I can dim tungsten lamps. Okay, well, tell me about channel one. It has a DMX. It's this sort of conversation that's going on down your DMX line so that your console is building up this knowledge of what fixtures. You see, what sensors do you have? I have a temperature sensor. Okay, tell me the value of it. It's 26 degrees. Okay, and then it goes on and asks the next device. Okay, well, are you there? And that's part of the rig checking. Say, are you there? And if you don't get a response, you can say, okay, well, there's a problem with this fixture and the lighting console can display that to you as an end user. So that gives you the sort of idea. Again, I like that idea of chopping a DMX cable and listening to what conversations are going on down it. This is the sort of thing you can imagine you would hear in that situation. Okay, um, DMX only devices ignore 
remote device management and the DMX signal isn't disrupted. Which might lead you on to uh, the question, and we had this question in one of our sessions yesterday. If DMX only devices ignore RDM, doesn't RDM device cause flicker? And this is a, um, a common question we find in the industry or a common assumption that remote device management causes your lights to flicker. Um, RDM would never have been released if it caused your lights to flicker. So that is not in itself what the problem is. So let's just spend one or two minutes investigating this and understanding what's going on. Because at a very basic level, it can be true that you turn on RDM and lights start to flicker. So what's going on there and why does that happen? Well, to look into this, we need to come back to my um, layout here of what's going on down a DMX cable. Remember the top level there is the kind of super simplified version and the bottom one there is exactly the same but the not quite so simplified but still simplified version. And what you'll see is that you've got your channels and then you've got your RDM question and your RDM answer. But if you look at the bottom line, you'll see there's a break, a mark after break, and then something called a start code. And you'll see that that exists both for the DMX data at the beginning there, and then about two thirds, three quarters of the way down, there's another start code there for RDM. And what a start code is, is just a little message that the console sends to the fixture to say, hi, I'm gonna start speaking to you in DMX, or hi, I'm gonna start speaking to you in RDM. And you could have a different start code. So I could send a start code that says, hello, I'm gonna start speaking to you in John gibberish, and that would be perfectly allowed as well. So you can have start codes and they say, well, I'm gonna start speaking to you in this language. Um, and so these start codes are super important. It allows the uh, fixture to know, should I be listening to this as DMX? and be listening to it to control where I'm pointing and what color I am and what intensity I am? Or should I be listening to this data from a monitoring and configuration point of view? So what should I be doing with this data? They're really, really important. Um, oh, I've gone ahead one slide there, sorry. Um, now the problem is when there was only DMX and RDM didn't exist, there were a bunch of manufacturers that decided, well, the start code is always DMX. It always says, hello, I'm DMX, and then it sends channels 1, 2, 3, all the way to 512, and then it starts again saying, hello, I'm DMX, and 1 to 512, and it starts again. So I just, I'm just going to ignore it, because it's always DMX. So why am I bothering processing this and worrying about it? It's always DMX. And so all these devices just decided, I'm going to assume everything is DMX, which is absolutely fine when everything is DMX. But as soon as we add RDM data in, that becomes a problem. So it's not RDM data that is causing the flicker. It is a bad implementation of the DMX standard. Nothing to do with RDM, because remember, I could have a start code that says, hello, I'm going to speak in John gibberish to you, and that would be allowed. So it's nothing to do with RDM. It's to do with um, bad implementations or incorrect implementations of DMX. So if you find this problem, go back to the manufacturer of the fixtures that are flickering and uh, ask them why it's happening. Uh, but that doesn't really help you if it's 10 minutes before your show and everything's flickering. So here are a couple potential solutions for you. One, you might have noticed that the RDM question and answer section in my previous slide is shorter than the DMX. Now, don't get me wrong, this is not to scale. But the, the period that the RDM section takes is um, shorter than the period the DMX session takes. And so um, if you change the DMX address of your fixtures to above 32, if this RDM start code thing is the problem, if that's what's causing the flicker, there's a 90% guarantee that addressing those flickering fixtures above DMX address 32 will fix the problem. Um, and if it doesn't, uh, addressing it above 257 definitely should. Um, now that's only a guarantee if this is what the problem is. Obviously there might be a million or one other reasons your fixtures are flickering. But if it's the RDM issue, um, these are the two numbers to, to remember. Um, and you should find that you um, don't see any more flickering when you do that. Um, an alternative option, going back to uh, our 0 to 8 splitter 8 unit here, is there's a little switch here called a fixed switch. And one of the things this does, it does lots of things, it tidies up the DMX and just generally makes it a nicer signal and sorts out any potential issues. But one of the things it does is get rid of anything that isn't 
DMX. And so it gets rid of RDM. And so when that's turned on, um, you can have RDM going into the input. It will still come out the through, because remember, there's no intelligence going on there. But the one to eight, you will not get any um, RDM messages coming out of that. And the reason that the switch is quite a, a useful thing is for a lot of people, they only care about RDM before their show. Now, I'm not saying everybody does. I think there's lots of very useful reasons to use RDM during a show. But for lots of people, they only care about it beforehand. They want to monitor things. They want to do rig checks. They want to make changes, all of those sorts of things. So with a switch, they can just enable all the RDM and they can do all their configuration and monitoring and just accept that there's a few flickers, but it doesn't matter because the show hasn't started yet. And then once they're happy that everything's working, they can just turn on the switch, which turns off all the RDM, um, and then they get no more flickering for the show itself. They lose all the benefits of having RDM, but that might be a benefit to them. So there are a few options there if you're finding RDM is causing this flickering. So I hope that's helpful to you. Okay, standard DMX splitters are not compatible. This is uh, something just to be aware of. Uh, we said earlier DMX only devices ignore RDM, and that is true for the vast majority. But you cannot send RDM messages through a DMX splitter successfully. Uh, you need to have an RDM splitter. So the splitter 8 that I showed you is an RDM splitter. There's plenty of other ones out there as well. Um, they are a bit more expensive, but they're, they're not dramatically more expensive. But there's a lot more intelligence going in there to manage your RDM messages. So just be aware of that one, that you uh, need to have RDM-capable splitters if you want to um, use RDM. Um, great. So that gives you an idea of RDM as a whole. Um, I like to talk about RDM a bit like a dictionary. So I speak English and the, the words I'm speaking are in the English dictionary. Um, but by no means am I using all of the words that are in the English, English dictionary. There's loads of words in the English dictionary that I don't use in my everyday vocab. Um, and so in the same way, RDM is just a, a, like a book of different options and tools that are available, but by no means does a device use all of them. Um, and so when you look at a console or a fixture that just says, yes, I support RDM, that doesn't really give you any more information than someone saying, yes, I speak English. Well, how well do you speak English? How much do you speak English? What's your vocabulary like? What's your skill level with the English language like? Exactly the same logic applies for remote device management. It's just a, a list of tools or a book of tools, and it's up to the manufacturers of fixtures and consoles and all of those sorts of things to decide um, what features it's going to use and how it's going to do those. And in a similar way, um, I have a, a, um, a certain selection of vocabulary that I use in my everyday speech, um, but there will be other people that speak the English language in a much more sophisticated way than I do. They're using the same words, but they're using them in a much better way. Um, and I would say the same is for RDM. I can use a tool that allows me to change the DMX address, but it's completely up to the console manufacturer how it's going to implement that. So is it going to have a button that says RDM and you have to click that and then you have to select the fixture and then you have to tell it what DMX address is and once it's got all that information, it's then going to send the message to the right? Or is it going to try and do it all automatically? Um, so earlier I showed you a video where it was a pretty manual process. You as the user went in and said this fixture, change it to this DMX address or change it to this mode. And what I'm going to show you now is um, the same console, the same fixtures using the same RDM messages, but this time the console's automating it. It's making the decisions of what DMX address to use. It's making the decisions of when to do things rather than the user. So hopefully between the previous video I showed you and this video I'm about to show you, you see the two extremes of how RDM can be used and it's probable that your console fits somewhere in between those two. So I'm going to show you that video now. We've come here to Stage Lighting Services in Cardiff to demonstrate our Plaza Innovation Award winning RigSync. We all use smartphones to access the internet and to do that they must have a unique IP address. The vast majority of us don't know or care what the IP address is as long as it works. Usually these unique addresses are given to our phones by something called a DHCP server. By replicating that functionality in our Flex console, we can remove the need to set up your lighting rig and make it just work. 
I have a range of equipment behind me that is all set to DMX Address 1. And I've got a brand new Flex S console here. As soon as I plug the DMX line in, RigSync is going to start detecting what's out there, automatically addressing it all and patching it. And there it's done. So I've got control of my dimmers down here. I've got control of my LED units and I've got control of my moving lights as well. RigSync, more importantly, is managing my whole rig. So I've got control of this moving light. If I go and change the DMX address of it to 100, instantly RigSync detects that there's been a change, repatches the console, and so I've still got control of that moving light. If I go and change the DMX address of this so it clashes with my beta pack here, RigSync instantly says you can't be DMX address 7 and has moved it to DMX address 18 where there are no collisions and it's repatched the console so I've still got full control of that device. This is currently in a small 26 channel DMX mode, mode 2, and I'm going to move it to mode 10 which takes up over 100 DMX addresses. Instantly RigSync has repatched the console. I've done a fixture swap out, so all my programming beforehand continues to work. And it's changed the DMX address to find a slot where that will fit. So I've still got full control of my light, just like I did before. RigSync also includes a feature called Lock Rig. I can just go to Setup, Inputs and Outputs, and enable it here. And now, if I go and try and change the address of this light from 7 to something else, Instantly, RigSync will just go and put it back to DMX address 7. In the same way, if I go and try and change the profile of this light from 10 to, let's say, mode 6, instantly, RigSync puts it back to 10. In fact, anything that's going to affect your show, such as pan tilt settings, mode, DMX address, will all automatically get changed back. This is all using something called RDM. It's a way that the console and all the devices can talk to each other. But not everything supports RDM. So for example, our Alpha Pack 3 unit that we've got here doesn't support RDM. So if I go and patch that in the normal way, just go to Add Fixtures, select a dimmer, say it's got three channels, I'm going to go and give it the DMX address that is the same as my moving light here. So DMX address 91. Now normally on most consoles at this point you would get a pop-up saying that you can't use that DMX address because it's already in use. But RigSync can sort that out. It can't change this address because that doesn't support RDM. So when I click finish it instantly changes the address of my moving light to move it out the way and again repatches my console so I've still got control of that light. We think RigSync is really going to help small to medium sized venues that don't have the luxury of a full time technician to manage their rig or to update all their paperwork. But most importantly, we think RigSync is going to save you time to enable you to create really great lighting designs. Okay, so I hope that's helpful to you. That's um, something we call RigSync. Um, but it shows you how using exactly the same RDM messages from the console, the console has implemented it in a completely different way. And hopefully that makes the point well that um, not in kind of unlike DMX with RDM, um, there's, there's many different ways that the console can implement it. And so seeing a console that says I do DMX is quite clear what that means, whereas seeing a console that says I do RDM you need to dig a bit more deeply into that and find out what features it does support, does it support, how it supports it, and all of those sorts of things. So, um, yeah, that's just worth thinking about. Okay, so earlier at the very beginning, I said we want to control, configure, and monitor our fixtures um, via this cable down the middle. And RDM allows us to configure and monitor them. Remember, it doesn't allow us to control them. And so there's that table that I said earlier, configure tick, control cross, monitor tick. And so when we use DMX and RDM together, we uh, finally manage to complete the puzzle picture and we get to do all three things down the DMX cable. 
Um, so I hope that's been a helpful overview. If you've got any questions, feel free to uh, put them in the chat now. But that is the, uh, the end of our DMX and RDM training session. Uh, earlier, I mentioned that there was a kind of part two, which is the Ethernet side of the, the puzzle. Uh, that is next week on Thursday, Thursday the 28th. Um, I think it's at 2 p.m. UK time, which is GMT plus one. So uh, that'll be on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. So feel free to uh, have a look at those. Um, if, you, if you're watching on demand <laughs> later on, feel free to ask questions still, and uh, one of the team will reply to your questions uh, within a, a few hours or so. So um, please do feel free to do that. But I hope that's been helpful. Um, we've got seven other training sessions coming up. Uh, one this afternoon and then the rest over the next week and a half. So 08.com forward slash training is where you will find all the information about those. So I hope it's been helpful. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, and hopefully we will see you at another session. Bye.